Good afternoon, everyone. I feel like I've got the post-lunch shift, so no one should be hangry. You should all be quite satisfied. And also, shout out to Rage Against the Machine, my seminal favourite band of all time ever. Um, as uh, Stephen Kyle introduced me, my name is Crystal Island. I currently work for Virgin Trains East Coast, soon to be the London North East Railway. And I'm here today to talk to you about a very subject that's very near to my heart, actually. Um, will robots destroy us all? Question mark. Um, I talk about this quite a lot, so if anyone wants to follow my ramblings and or cat pictures, you can follow me on Crystal Smile. And that's me with a robot. Um, just to introduce a, a little bit about myself and why I'm interested in this subject, um, I am a bit of an odd character. I studied the philosophy of technology uh, as a degree, um, which my parents were utterly horrified about, as you can imagine. Um, Crystal, what on earth are you going to do with that for a living? Um, and I've always been fascinated with the impact that technology has on us as a society in very broad terms. So I'm not a techie, I don't code, um, but if we think about the technology and how much this has shifted our lives in the last, particularly in the last 10 years, never has my de degree been more relevant than it is now. And it's certainly one of the reasons why I work for one of the world's biggest brands in technology is because I have an understanding of it. So when I joined the railways, um, as new blood in the railways, I don't know if anyone's travelled on the railways, but we're not the most technologically advanced um, of, of industries, I was there to be somebody to shake things up. Um, and I remember one of my first weeks, I think, in the company, and um, I was asked, Crystal, when are we going to be putting robots in our travel stations? And I looked, and I thought, have you been on a train in disruption? Could you imagine a wall of angry people that just want to get home? And this is happening right now, right? Um, thankfully, not on our line. Um, trying to get home, and what are they greeted with? They could be greeted with Pippa, our friendly robot. And I could tell you what they do with that robot. They would kick it, they would punch it in the face, and they certainly would not be wanting to ask Pippa when they were going to be getting home. So my view on that was quite um, controversial, really, when I sort of said, why on earth? would we want to put robots in train stations? What possible value will they serve with all this millions of pounds of investment that they will, uh, will require? Which raised a few eyebrows, which was fine. Um, oh, look, someone's put a really cool effect on that slide. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we are virgin, um, and, and we are known for having sort of core values and, and having worked with Richard and had the privilege of meeting him a few times. You know, we're there for a sense of adventure. We want to try new things. We want to push the boundaries, um, and that applies to technology, it applies to people, it applies to our brand and what we do. And we definitely like to shake things up. We don't want to follow the, the, the status quo. We want to try new things. We want to look beyond the norm. Um, one of the things that's obviously really exciting in, in rail and travel at the minute is the Hyperloop project. That's not normal, sending people through a vacuum in, in a train at, at uh, however many hundred miles an hour it is now is really, really cool stuff. So there is some exciting things on the horizon for, for rail and for technology. But let's just get down to specifics. A lot of people talk about AI. Some people have talked about AI today. Um, you'll probably go to several conferences this year, and it will be a really big agenda item. And I think what we do need to do is be really clear about what we're talking about when we discuss AI. So AI is the study of man-made computational devices and systems which can be made to act in a manner which we would be inclined to call intelligent. And that's quite an important f philosophical point, because actually what human beings perceive in the world as being something that is intelligent is based purely on a subjective impact. There is nothing that is objective about, uh, about intelligence. So we need to be really, really clear about that. We're not talking about bots and algorithms. We're talking about something that interprets and then creates that information in the world in an intelligent manner and therefore responds to it. And I did tell you I was a philosophy geek. So I'm going to introduce concepts here. I don't know if anyone's heard of the, the philosopher Thomas Kuhn. Thomas Kuhn was a philosopher of science, and he created a model um, called the paradynamic shift in science. And it's a really, really famous model that a lot of philosophy um, students learn. And I believe that AI and the revolution that is going to come, whether we like it or not, um, is, is very much in a Kuhnian cycle, a paradynamic shift in science and technology and the way in which we work with the world. And I believe at the minute we're in modal drift. So just to explain this model to you, normal science is a period where our reality and our way of accepting the world is kind of accepted broadly across society. So think about um, a, a big shift would be something like Darwinism, um, evolution, physics, looking at the nuclear age. And you think about how each one of those leaps has then led into a new way of us understanding and exploring the world. And I think at the minute we have started our journey in AI. I think this modal drift is about us creating things um, that, that are starting to sort of interpret the world very differently. And the whole um, essence of my talk will be around the way that that will affect our way of work. 
I think once we've um, had another two or three years, we're going to enter into modal crisis, and I'll take you through some reasons why. Modal crisis is really about everything being thrown up in the air and seeing where the chips may fall. And then we'll enter another revolution where we possibly will be looking at space travel and how AI can automate things to allow us to explore another, um, another world. And I'll tell you what's driving modal drift at the minute. It is the battle between your HR department and your finance department. So coming back to my um, earlier example about, Crystal, when are we going to put robots in the stations? Whenever you work in an organization in a senior level or any level, when you're talking about technology, you have to have these two hats on. Your HR department is thinking, how can I handle this change, this huge paradynamic, paradynamic leap well? How can I protect people but also protect the interests of the company? Your finance director is thinking very different things. Your finance director is thinking, how can I make or save money? And we have to really think about that and put that debate front and center whenever we're talking about AI and we're ever talking about putting an automated workforce or um, creating greater efficiencies through robots and organizations. Rail is a unionized industry. If I come in and start telling everyone that we need to start putting robots in stations, that's not going to go down very well with about 80% of my workforce. And I think that AI should be viewed more so as a problematic opportunity. So 65% of organizations say they view it as um, a technological disruption as an opportunity rather than a threat. And I, I actually would be inclined to agree with them. But I think what we must do is create enough debate around the potential side effects, negativity, around AI as we are currently doing around all of the opportunities. So you won't go to many conferences where someone like me and stand up and go, we all need to be a little bit more careful with the AI. Everyone is going to tell you about all these wealth opportunities, they've got all the amazing things that it can do. We can save you money, make you money. But I think as much energy needs to be going on to the other side. And I'll tell you this is why. Forrester, clever guys, they like stats, predict that by 2027, the US economy will lose 17% of jobs to robotics. It will only create 10% of those, leaving a void of 7%. That is equal to the, um, the job losses experienced in the Greatest Depression of the last century. The, the Great Depression um, was the most miserable, horrible time in, society, in modern day society. And I think if we're not careful, we could sleepwalk into that very easily. And I, I like a bit of Karl Marx, I thought I'd throw a quote in. But machines where it may be said, the weapon employed by capitalists to quell the revolt of specialized labor. And I think what, what we're looking at here is, you will get a lot of speakers coming on, and, and I know one personally who's a friend of mine, we always argue about this, who will tell you that AI will allow us, will free us up to use our intellect and intelligence to get away from all of the menial tasks on a day-to-day -day basis, and will free humans up to be more creative, do different jobs. That's quite a Marxist thing to say. I disagree, because actually the people, the real people that AI, and when people talk about that, that you are taking the jobs away from, are telesales people, are physical human beings in train stations, in call centers, in shops, and what are these people going to do? We have to think about that as a society, we have to consider it. And it's a really kind of adapt or die situation. So just looking at one um, large corporate saying that about a sixth um, of the core skills of the workforce will be need to be different three years from today from what they are today. And that's a huge shift. What are we doing to retrain people? Where's the education? Are we getting people into the skills? And what this is creating is something, a phenomenon called job paranoia. Um, I work, um, I'm one of the youngest people in my team. I'm the leader of the team. I have people in my team that are 55 years old. I have some that are in the 40s. I have one gentleman who's 60. Can you imagine as a workforce all you are hearing is that you are going to be replaced by robots. How do you drive in the next five to ten years um, operational excellence, performance of your teams, when people are sat there thinking, I'm going to be replaced by a robot? And this is creating a real kind of sense of, of paranoia about people's jobs. And you're not going to get the best out of people if that is the way that they're working. And actually, ethically, that doesn't sit very well with me. Um, looking at our own industry, um, I think there's, there's broad kind of acceptance and, and, and a sort of a 50-50 split here, people being quite positive about AI. But what we are seeing is over half, so 61% of marketers believe that the um, integration of AI will re result in a loss of jobs. Again, marketers are quite a skilled workforce. Many of us have, have got degrees, we've been to universities to study this. So what are we going to do? 61% <laughs> think we're going to lose jobs. Um, and really, th there's a very clear, very loud message coming across that marketers do not want AI anywhere near creativity. 
So the point at which we try and automate creativity, we're losing something quite important and fundamental human skill. And equally, we're then talking about recruitment. So I was at um, a Virgin talk, and there was a, a system that's been built which will do um, sift candidates at first level through AI, um, through video conferencing. And it horrified me. And I thought, why are we bulk um, sifting candidates through video um, and getting the robots to tell us whether this person is a good uh, employee or not? Um, and this is really about how businesses, and it's a, it, I'm going to be quite controversial, but particularly male-run businesses miss out on a key skill of human beings. They call them soft skills. And it's a big theme um, that runs through technology a lot. It demeans soft skills. It demeans the gut feeling that someone's going to do something right. It, it's about understanding the emotional context of something and what triggers people so that you can get the best out of them. And we use this model quite a lot at, um, at Virgin Trains East Coast. And this is called um, the SCARF model. And what we do when we're in a leadership position is understand when people act badly when you're working with them, there's generally a reason why. And it's usually because you're threatening one of these key things. So are you threatening their status? Are you an expert in t train timetabling, just an example from my industry, being told that a robot can come in and do it 10 times faster and better than you? So you're challenging someone's status who's probably worked there for 20 years. Their certainty. So they, they know that job inside and out. They've done it for 20 years, but well, maybe I'm not that good. Maybe I can't really do it. The autonomy. Oh, well, I can get a robot to do the work of five people, and they don't even need to be told what to do. Their relatedness, their connection to their business and what they're doing, and they will then start feeling that their sense of fairness is being eroded. And if you can't manage organizational development around these three things, you'll never get the center point, which is their understanding as to why things are changing. So key questions that we need to think about. What will shape the workforce of the future? What is the art of the possible in digital technology? For me, AI isn't about putting robots in stations. AI is much bigger than that. There's lots of other things that we can do that. And I would ask everybody to reflect on their own personal organizations and start dreaming up, dream big, and then come back down to reality. What skills and capabilities are needed in your organization in the next two to five years? I was recently with a very large FTSE 250 company giving a similar talk. Um, and I caught their CEO afterwards, and he said to me, what am I going to do? Who knows about AI? Who can I hire? This workforce doesn't exist. The strategic thinking is not out there because there's not many people that have actually spent a lot of time dealing with it. Um, which organizational models best achieve integration of human and intelligent automa automation? So at what point, what skills are required to ensure that that intelligent automation is managed properly and, and that people understand it through? And really importantly for me, what is the moral and ethical framework that leaders wish to work within in relation to workforce displacement, transition, and replacement? How are your organizations going to manage that effectively? And what can the existing human workforce expand on to, in its current role to provide the things that bots just simply cannot? What are the real things that people, skills in your organization can deliver that a robot never can do? And how can organizations redesign their current job profiles to attract and retain and absorb future talent? Um, there's a lot of discussion in the workforce at the minute. I was um, very lucky to speak with somebody from IKEA recently who is completely redesigning the way that IKEA work in 10 years' time. So instead of having a rotor of shifts for people in the shops, people are going to be able to elect when they want to work, where they want to work from. They can use technology to work remotely. This is a complete game changer for anyone who's used to being sat in an office or a shop nine till half five. And I think the key thing really is, and a question for us all to ask ourselves as technology leaders, are we just going to let the future happen to us? Or are we going to steer towards a preferable future? If we aren't careful, in the next two or three years, this will happen so fast to us that we will never have had the chance to change it again. And we'll be displacing people. People will lose jobs with nothing to go to. And actually, we can do something about it. We can start talking about it now. And this is one of my favorite examples of why we're not really there yet and why actually a lot of this kind of dystopian future just is, needs to be built on. I don't know if anyone from Sky is here, so I'm sorry, but this is your uh, creative director who tweeted that he was going on a diet. It's just got serious. He's deleted his Domino's and Just Eat apps. To which the bot from Domino's replied, do you want to place an order, James? You know, come on, get your pizza. Versus the person behind Just Eat who's like, oh, please don't go. So these bots, you know, they, they lack that human intelligence. They're not there yet. They don't have those soft skills. Equally, a lot of the technology advancements we're seeing that everyone heralds as like the next big thing, they're not actually working. So Google killed off its experimental hands-free payment app. Um, recently in South Bay, you, you, know, you used to be able to go in it and recognize your face. You could pay for your avocado green grass smoothie really quickly. Um, equally, there was a lot of hype in retail last year around this Amazon shop where you just basically went in. Um, you, could pay, you didn't have to pay for anything. You could just check out. And actually, it can't cope with more than 20 people at any one time. So all of those millions of pounds that invested in it were kind of a bit... You know, not quite as advanced as they were. 
And one of the things I would say is people that are talking about the bad side of AI and automization tend to be um, ridiculed in the press. Um, Elon Musk, Bill Gates, um, Stephen Hawking before he died were all warning about this happening. And Elon particularly, you know, we could end up with a fleet of artificially enhanced robots capable of destroying us all. And he was absolutely ridiculed for this. And, and actually, we should not ridicule people who just have an alternative opinion. He's not a stupid guy, neither is Bill Gates, neither was Stephen Hawking, so potentially we should be listening to them a bit more. Just because they're not saying what people want to hear uh, doesn't mean they're wrong. Um, I love this example of the two Facebook, ro Facebook robots who are actually um, learning how to trade between themselves and develop their own special language because the human language was completely inefficient, so they bypassed it. And they had to be shut down because they weren't allowed to actually have their own language. So this stuff isn't perfect, and the people that are building it certainly don't see every outcome. But there are beacons of hope. One of the beacons of hope is an organization which I'd urge you all to look at, which is something called AI for All. It's actually been set up by Bill Gates' wife. AI for all is trying to tackle um, a problem that I believe somebody else raised earlier, which is that there is an incredible problem in AI, which is that it's all been coded by white men. And I'm sorry to say that, because it's a bit controversial, but it's true. And the problem is, is that when you create a, a language framework that AI is built upon, um, you inherit something which is called bias, and particularly gender bias and racial bias. And it, you don't even know you're doing it. You know, it's, it's, it's a very quiet bias, to the point at which now Microsoft and Facebook have both had to develop anti-bias algorithms to try and weedle out where bias exists within their own, own AI frameworks. That's how bad this, <laughs> this bias is. So AI for All is set up as an organization who works with lots of the massive universities in America to get people from um, different um, BAME communities, women, coding, so that we don't go so far along this gender bias route that it's too late to come back. And um, if you have a look at some of the work they do, it's absolutely excellent. Um, they work with impoverished communities, trying to get people into this because we know it's going to be the, the workforce of the future. Another way that AI, I think, is a really positive thing, um, this is Babylon Health. I um, met the founder of Babylon Health, and his reason for setting up this AI-driven um, health app was that in Africa, they, don't, they can't get doctors. In, in poorer countries, in India, they can't access a GP. It costs a lot of money. But for five pounds, you can actually access this very, very sophisticated, NHS endorsed, by the way, um, piece of AI that will tell you whether you definitely do need to go to a doctor or not. It can generate you prescriptions with a sign-off from a GP. It's a fantastic piece of kit. And actually, we do need to be a bit less snobby about communities that, that you know, at the end of the day, do you need to see a doctor, yes or no? And, and for people with children, if they can't access healthcare, this stuff could be really, really valuable. Some of the technologies really working in my field, we talk a lot about payments technologies, using face identification, fingerprint technology, MasterCard have rolled this out quite effectively. A dream of a day where you can just walk into a train station, it'll recognize your face and you can just get on and I'll bill you afterwards, because nobody likes those paper tickets, do they, let's be honest. Um, but it's a while away. And more recently, we've just launched the world's first Amazon Alexa skill. Um, so we're the first um, train company to be able to retail um, tickets through Alexa. Um, it's a big gamble for us that might not work. I believe someone was talking recently about the, um, the actual kind of real figures behind voice search recently and sort of saying how it's not as, as, as a growth area as it is. But coming back to that Virgin thing, you know, we don't want to not try things, but I think what we want to do is try them cautiously but optimistically. And I'll just wrap up with a few more slides. Um, I recently went to um, a big talk by a lady called Linda Lucas. She is working extensively, um, and she's created a lot of books um, called Ruby. And Ruby is a children's book, which is all about getting kids to understand the way that how to learn to code. So it's about solving problems, about taking on gender. And I've got a four-year-old. Anyone who follows me knows I've got a small child. And I bought the books, and they're absolutely fantastic. And what Linda did talk about was a quote that really resonated with me. She said, computers are magic, but they are not magical. And I think that's something that we all need to really remember. We have created them, and they are not just magical things that are going to exponentially um, you know, create. So we need to be optimistically cautious about them. And just to finish up, um, one machine could do the work of 50 ordinary men, but no machine could do the work of one extraordinary man. And I think that's something that we all need to remember when we start deposing ourselves to machines and just welcoming in the automation revolution that you know, we created that, so let's be the masters of our own destiny. And I'll leave you with that. Thank you.